All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We have a packed agenda this morning. Um, as we do every year, we like to begin the meeting with a um, re recitation of the names of the victims that we are honoring and remembering here today. And that's how we will start today. Allegheny County, Robert Hughes, also known as William Burns, 1907. Anne Arundel County, John Sims, 1875. George Briscoe, 1884. Wright Smith, 1898. Henry Davis, 1906. King Johnson, 1911. Calvert County, Charles Whitley, 1886. Baltimore County, Howard Cooper, 1885. Carroll County, Townsend Cook, 1885. Frederick, 1861. John Jones, 1872. James Carroll, 1879. John Biggest, 1887. James Bowens, 1895. Harford County, Isaac Moore, 1868. Jim Quinn, 1869. Lewis Harris, 1900. Kent County, James Taylor, 1892. Montgomery County, George Peck, 1880. John Diggs Dorsey, 1880. Sidney Randolph, 1896. Prince George's County, Merlin. Thomas Jurix, 1869. John Henry Scott, 1875. Michael Green, 1878. Stephen Williams, 1890. St. Mary's County, Benjamin Hans, 1887. Somerset County, Isaac Kemp, 1894. William Andrews, 1897. James Reed, 1907. George Armwood, 1933. Lycomico County, Garfield King, 1898, Matthew Williams, unknown, 1931. So thank you to everyone who contributed to that. Um, I think it sets the, sets the tone pretty well. So, um, you know, there's so many people who have been um, with us from the beginning, and I see the names that are, uh, you know, people filing in, people in the room. I can't help but think about you know, that how far we've come in, in really in the three in the three years that, that we've been around. 
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful for, it, for the presence of, of all of you, uh, long timers who've, and, and for your support. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like yesterday we were actually in this very room, crammed into the room, trying to um, figure out how to, how to make things run. And um, because of you, it, it did run and it's still running. Um, and that's because it's important to you. Um, you know, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the uh, battles, um, outrage du jour, and get frustrated or, or impatient. And I have to confess, I'm I'm probably as guilty of that as as anyone um, here. Um, but I think you know, we today we we should also reflect on on what's already been accomplished in just three years, right? Change is insidious; it it kind of creeps up on you. But when we held our first conference three years ago. You know, we had 30 or 40 people on our, on our mailing list, and today we have 2,500. Um, there were no coalitions at the time to speak of, um, and now we have coalitions in 13 or 14 uh, of the counties, um, of the 17 counties where, where we know that racial terror lynchings occurred. Um, there were no EJI historical markers in the state, and now there are uh, five. Um, and there was no lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the state. The law hadn't even been submitted yet, but now we have a commission that's uh, been in business for, for two years, and they're starting to, to hold hearings. And, and actually, um, the, these public hearings are going to be an important topic that we consider uh, during today's conference. So <clears throat> just stop for a minute and, and think of how remarkable it is that a former slave state Right, is taking responsibility for the racial terror that occurred within our borders. Um, you know, that's 38 lynchings we're talking about, at least. Uh, and that includes a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. So, and 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 we're doing this. It's we were making this deliberate um, effort uh, to try to understand, you know, why and how that happened, uh, to try and gauge the trauma that it inflicted and and to figure out how to repair it. Um, and honestly, that. That alone is amazing. And we all did that and you did that. And it's important now, it's an important topic in the public square because it's important to you. Um, you know, earlier this week, I had the honor of um, speaking at the dedication of the EJI historical marker in um, Leonardtown in St. Mary's County. And it was a, it was a beautiful ceremony and uh, Janice Walthour and, and Karen Stone are to be thanked for that. Um, the ceremony was on November 1st, and I, I was asked to speak about the significance of that date in Maryland history. Uh, many of you already know that uh, November 1, 1864, was the day that slavery was officially abolished in Maryland, because the third state constitution had just been ratified, and the constitution, that constitution, um, explicitly prohibited slavery. Until then, um, slavery was not only tolerated in the state, it was sanctioned. Um, it was protected by the by law, by the previous constitution and other laws. And you might be thinking, well, what about the 13th Amendment? Didn't that take effect on Jan uh, you know, earlier? Yes, the 13th Amendment went into effect on January 1st of 1863, almost two years earlier than this Maryland constitution. But um, the 13th Amendment didn't apply to Maryland because we were still a union state. It only applied to slaves in the Confederacy. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a comment that Chris Haley of the archives once made, which is that uh, Lincoln freed the slaves over whom he had no control. So it is a significant day in history, but um, you know, in researching this assignment about, about, the, um, about the date, um, I learned that the referendum to pass the constitution was, was close. I mean, it was, it was really close. Um, in fact, it's generally believed that it only passed because of absentee ballots that were cast by soldiers who were, who were still on the battlefields. 1864, there was a civil war going on. And the final tally for that referendum was 30,000 uh, and change for it in favor of freeing the slaves and just under 30,000 against it. And so that is a margin, the actual margin was 375 votes out of 60,000 votes cast. That's six tenths of 1%. That is how close Maryland came to remaining a slave state, which is surprising to me. But here's what I take from that. In Maryland today, we are, we are really on the vanguard of I think of the truth and reconciliation effort in this country. We have a state commission with a mandate. We have coalitions dedicated to this work around the state. We have you. Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, um, 
I don't know if you saw the Dan Roderick's column uh, yesterday in yesterday's paper, but he, he has this one line that I think really, um, I, I think captures the, the spirit of what we're doing. And he talked about um, Maryland's public reckoning with the ugliest aspects of the state's past continues with dutiful honesty and deliberate righteousness. And um, this is deliberate and that, that, that's really the point. Um, yeah, and, and this reckoning that we're a part of, it's important because you have made it important, right? 375 votes. Think how, how different things would have been um, if the soldiers who cast those ballots and were in the midst of fighting the bloodiest war in our history um, didn't vote to abolish slavery. It was important because they made it important. Um, and I think it would be helpful to keep that in mind as we move forward, because this, this urgency, this demand for racial justice that we are bringing to the public square, this, it's only gonna remain important as long as, as long as we believe it to be and act accordingly. Um, someone in this, a couple of years ago, um, I had spoken to a group and someone um, asked me after I spoke, well, you know, what can I do? What should I do about this? And, and, and you know, for a moment I didn't have an answer because you know, we can't all be Brian Stevenson and we can't, um, or Cheryl and Eiffel, but you know, at the very least we can, we can be aware, we can speak up, we can be more empathetic, we can learn, right? We can read, we can um, examine this dark history honestly and, and try to understand how this legacy continues to damage people because it does, you know, of course it does. Um, and that's precisely why we have a commission and really that's why we're, we're all here today because it continues to damage us all. And we recognize that and it's important to us uh, to do something about it. Last year, right after the George Floyd killing, I, I, I read a great art essay by Barbara Smith and she pointed out that institutional white supremacy does not require individual bigotry in order to function because it's a universal operating system. And I think to me, at least that was very clarifying and, and in a way liberating because what it does is it separates intent from effect. Um, white supremacy does not require individual bigotry. And I, I think what follows from that is that we have to be more deliberate about, about looking for it and about dismantling that machine, because that, that is really what the task here is, right? Lynching was the most virulent expression of, of white supremacy, but white supremacy is still the operating system. So I'm hopeful that... Um, Today's program is going to help all of us understand the many forms that it takes and help us find the resolve to uh, do what we can to dismantle that enormous machine. Um, we all we you know we all we all do what we can do. That's why you're here, right? Um, 375 votes. So I want to uh, now basically go over the agenda, what we're going to be um, doing today. Um, soon we'll be hearing from Brian Stevenson. Then we're going to be. Uh, talking about the um, very important um, public hearings of the Maryland Lynching Trade, uh, Lynching uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We'll be uh, learning about the um, lynching of Matthew Williams on the, on the, uh, uh, in Salisbury in 1931. Um, we are going to take a look at uh, an exhibit at the Lewis Museum right now, Bodies of Information, and then we'll have a visit from Ida B. Wells in the person of Deborah Mims. Um, there's going to be an amazing story that you can hear about today about Lieutenant Walter Manning, uh, who was a Tuskegee Airman born in Baltimore. We'll learn about the new website that's being um, mounted by uh, uh, Deneen uh, Brown and, and her colleagues at uh, the Maryland School of Journalism at University of Maryland. Uh, Jason Green will speak to us. Elliot, Elliot Spillers of uh, EJI will, uh, will join us at the end to announce uh, a couple of new um, essay social justice essay com, uh, competitions, and then, um, and then we will be adjourned. And hopefully you won't be uh, late for your next class. Uh, you know, Brian Stevenson, I, I don't think is, um, needs an introduction to most anyone in, in who's, who's watching us right this right now. Um, he was, uh, as you know, he is the uh, founder and the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. He wrote a magnificent book, Just Mercy, which I can't recommend highly enough. Um, and he continues to be a beacon for um, social justice and racial justice um, in this country. And we were very fortunate that uh, Brian agreed to uh, record a message for this meeting. And I wanna share that with you now. 
Hi, my name is Brian Stevenson and I want to extend my appreciation and gratitude to the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project for the important work that it is doing across the state to help our communities heal and move forward. At the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, we have Maya Angelou's powerful words uh, printed on the side of our building. Ms. Angelou said that history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. It is important that we face our past, that we reckon with our history. We believe in memorialization in this country. Within a very short period of time after the tragedy of 9-11, people recognized it was important to create a memorial to honor the lives of all of those who were lost, uh, to create a space that would cause us, motivate us, inspire us to not forget the pain, the trauma, the tragedy of that day. In Washington, D.C., uh, the community is saturated with memorials and monuments that help this nation reflect and celebrate its past. Not all of it is positive. There's a memorial to the thousands of brave women and men who died during the Vietnam War. There's a memorial to people who fought and struggled to preserve freedom during World War II. There's a memorial to the great crisis that this country overcame in the 19th century when a president dared to lead us back to a nation as one. And the Lincoln Memorial sits above the city in ways that are important. And when you go to these spaces, you not only remember things critical about our past, but you begin to believe things about what we can do in our future. That is the goal and the uh, objective behind the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project's work. We have a history in this country that is challenging when it comes to race. We are a nation that tolerated the genocide, the destruction of millions of native people uh, when Europeans came to this continent. We kept their words, but we made the people leave. And we haven't really done much to acknowledge that history. We also are a nation that endured two and a half centuries of slavery. For decades, black people were enchained and brutalized and mistreated, abused. We tolerated things that we should never have tolerated. We created these false narratives that argued that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people are less worthy, less deserving. And that narrative, that history created a legacy that continues to challenge us today. There are problems with discrimination and bigotry, and we won't overcome those problems if we don't have the courage to acknowledge the past, the roots of these problems. And that's why reckoning with the history of lynching is so important. Lynching was lawlessness. Lynching was terrorism. Lynching was tragic. And it created consequences that are devastating for communities today, which is why when we come together and we talk honestly about that past, when we confront that past, we open doors to repair, to reconciliation, to restoration, to redemption. I am someone who believes in the power of truth-telling. And I believe in the power of truth-telling because I believe that truth can set us free. Truth can lead us to healing. Truth can lead us to a better place. I come from a faith tradition and in my church, you can't come in and say, I want salvation and heaven and all of the good stuff, but not be willing to admit, to confess, to repent, to deal with the things that separate us from the kind of right relationship, right community, right love that brings a community together. I'm incredibly proud of the work that's happening in Maryland. As someone who grew up on the Delmarva Peninsula, someone who grew up on the Eastern Shore, I know the challenges that we've had to overcome. I started my education in a colored school uh, in Sussex County, Delaware. They didn't allow black kids in, in, in that county to go to high school when my dad was a teenager, and yet courageous people came together and opened up public schools, and that's, be, that's the reason why I got to go to high school. 
got to go to college, got to go to law school. I'm a product of Delmarva. I'm a product of the Eastern Shore, and I'm proud of the people that live there that fought to make things better. Well, we still have work to do. And there are people all over the state of Maryland fighting to make things better, and I hope you will embrace them. I hope you will join them. There is real power in community. I've been to Germany, and I've seen how that nation has reckoned with the history of the Holocaust. When you go to Berlin, you can't go 200 meters without seeing markers and stones that have been placed next to the homes of Jewish families that were abducted during the Holocaust, that cab drivers and the hotel operators encourage you to go to the Holocaust Memorial. And because of that reckoning, I'm hopeful, I'm comfortable. When I go to the nation state of Germany, there are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. It would be unconscionable for someone to want to celebrate and honor the defenders and perpetrators of the Holocaust. We haven't made all of that progress in the United States, but it is happening. And it is happening through critically important work led by the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. I just want to celebrate all of you who are contributing to this work. I want to encourage all of you to have the confidence, to have the courage to do this important work. And mostly, I want to thank you for modeling the kind of truth and justice, modeling the kind of repair that our nation desperately needs to see. This is a very polarized time in American history. It's important that there be a community of people who are pushing past uh, that divide, pushing past that fear and anger and creating symbols of hope that help communities thrive, grow, and move into the future healthier, stronger, better. That is the work before us, and thank you all for contributing to that work. And thank you, Brian, for that. For, before we go any further, I just wanted to make a correction. I, some couple of people um, reminded me that I wasn't, ref when I referred to the 13th Amendment earlier, I was meant to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, and I apologize for that error. Um, I'm the first of many, I'm sure. Um, we are getting the Maryland Lynch, uh, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission really is reaching um, what I think is probably the most um, important stage of, of its existence, and that is the, uh, the conduct of these um, public, uh, public hearings. Um, this is going to allow us um, the unique opportunity to, to um, you know, confront the truth about racial terror um, in the communities where these lynchings occurred. And um, Cheryl and I, will, you know, um, as she pointed out, um, just as lynchings are local, uh, lynchings are local, and just as they were local, so too must uh, reconciliation be. And um, so we've assembled a panel, I think, of some pretty impressive individuals to talk about um, the, the hearings um, uh, that, are, that are coming up. Um, and I want to introduce them to you now. Um, first of all, joining us uh, is um, Nicholas Creary from, um, Dr. Nicholas Creary from, who's from Moravian College. Nick is a commissioner on the uh, MLTRC. He's also uh, on the board of directors um, of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. And Nick really did a lot of this groundbreaking research that, that um, made all of this possible. Um, Jack Del Nunzio is, uh, attended our first conference in 2018 as a, an undergraduate uh, at American University and, and he's just completed uh, his master's. So he's wearing really two hats here today. One as the co-leader of the Carroll County Coalition and, and he's also the project coordinator for the Maryland lynching oral history initiative that we are funding along with the John Mitchell uh, Justice Program at George Mason. Um, Clory Jackson is the leader of the Allegheny County uh, Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Committee. They just held the, the first hearing um, that uh, of this whole schedule that, that the, um, the commission will be holding. And, and it was an incredible experience, I have to tell you. And so um, it was done so carefully and, and it was so thoughtfully researched and organized by Clory and, and Carolyn Hahn and, and the rest of that committee. And I think they really set the bar. We're gonna show you a little testimony from that uh, in just a little bit. And of course, Delegate uh, Jocelyn Pandy Melnick um, of District 21, who was the lead sponsor um, for passing that legislation, HB 307, and without whom I am certain um, we, that there would be no law. So first, uh, Delegate Penny Melnick, I, I, you know, I wanna ask you, um, you know, what was your vision? Now we're two years in, what was your vision for, for creating this law? And thank you, Will, it's an honor to be with this um, 
wonderful panel and, uh, and thank you for giving me the time to be with you today. So I remember getting an email in my office and we get, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds of emails every week. And I remember getting an email from Dr. Nicholas Curry and we read it, my staff and I, and uh, I emailed him back and we agreed to meet at Starbucks. I don't know if he recalls. So we met at a Starbucks, we didn't know each other. And, uh, and we started to talk about his research and the importance for Maryland to create a historical account of the number of, of cases of people that were lynched. And I was so inspired by his research, by his passion, that by the time we left, immediately right from the little table at Starbucks, I call our department that does the bill drafting. I don't know if you recall that. And I put him on and I asked the drafter, this is what I want to do. And I don't have any idea yet what that would look like, but this is the idea. This is what this gentleman, the research has done. I'm giving you permission because we have to do that to speak with him for the drafting. And when it's done, please let me see a copy and we'll share it around to make sure it captures what we wanted to do. So I wanted to create a historical account to have a public airing of these stories. I wanted people to know that as a public, as a proud member of the Black Caucus and Latino Caucus as a Black Latina, you know, this is, well, this was important to me. It moved me. Um, I wanted to address the importance of this systemic injustices. Um, I, I wanted to investigate and bring to justice those that um, were impacted by racial lynching. I wanted Maryland to know its past, to really, how can we move forward if we don't know where we come from? It's so important to memorialize it for my kids, for their kids to, read this history, you know, it brings shame, but also I wanted to start healing and I wanted to find a way to make it part of our history and for us to never forget. So, you know, the, the legislation was a bipartisan support. It took a lot of work to draft it in a way that was careful that I didn't get opposition. Um, and it passed the Maryland House and Senate unanimously. Um, the bill was signed into law on April 18th, 2019. And, you know, it's the first time, the first time in our country that we have such a commission. And as we know, other countries are doing it. So um, it's been an honor, absolute honor to be part of this process. And I can't thank you and all the commissioners enough for your time and dedication and for Dr. Curry for your work. You know, there's a Buddhist saying that says that you don't die when you're cremated or when you're buried. You die when the last deed you have performed on earth is forgotten and your work will live forever. This is important. We must face our history and address it. Thank you so much. That was, that was beautifully said. Nick, um, I know that you helped write the bill um, and, and you are a commissioner. And I'm just kind of wondering, we're two years into it now. What, you know, what might have, what surprised you? What's happened that you didn't expect or uh, vice versa? And we'll just, I, I'm interested to hear how that's worked for you. Sure. Um, I guess what's happened that, that I wasn't expecting, I think that, that any of us were expecting, of course, was the pandemic. Um, you know, and that, that has certainly affected, you know, certainly how we're doing the, the work of the commission. But I think, you know, in, in some ways, you know, sort of the, the silver lining of that, you know, what with the Zoom revolution, I think that's opened up access to the work of the commission in ways that we wouldn't have been able to do, you know, before the Zoom revolution of that. I mean, the fact that we've got what is it, 166 people, you know, signed in right now, um, I think speaks to, you know, the ability for us to, to do this work and to, and to spread the work across the state in ways that, you know, again, I, I don't know that all of us who are here on this Zoom call right now would have been able to get together physically, you know, ha had that been the case. Um, so yeah, I, I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, and again, I always try to find the, the good in something that we're, we're reaching, 
you know, a national and international global audience now. Um, and so really the eyes of the world are on us in a way that I was certainly hoping would be the case uh, when, I, when I first contacted Dr. Pinion, uh, Delegate Pinion Milnick's office. Um, but also in a way this, this allows the world to join us and to work with us in ways that, that I couldn't have imagined back then. So yes, I am, you know, as Delegate Pinion Elmick said, you know, I am incredibly humbled by the work and what we've been able to accomplish in, in such a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, I guess when I kind of first started, I kind of had visions of, you know, sort of Watergate style hearings with the commission there and microphones and, and people lined up and, and all of that and sort of, you know, fiery debates and discussions. But the fact that the work is being done and the way it's being done with respect, with humility, with an eye to, in many ways, really restoring the humanity of these people who were murdered, you know, a, as a result of, you know, an environment that not only supported it, but encouraged it. Yeah. And so now as we start thinking about, you know, and again, I'm going to use the R word reparations, you know, because you, you mentioned, you know, talking about repairing. You know, now the job, you know, has come to us to start to make those reparations. You know, how do we fix a system still based and rooted in white supremacy? How do we undo those things? And that's where I think the hearings are going to be so important. And, you know, the two things that came up in the Allegheny County, you know, hearing, you know, the, the, you know, the need for police reform and police training and, you know, learn, you know, unlearning those, those trauma-informed behaviors that, you know, people in, in the communities that have been affected by lynching and racism, you know, I think that's, that's what we've got to do now, start listening carefully and empathetically to the people in those communities, and then start bringing that into the recommendations that we make and bring forward to the General Assembly, you know, as we conclude that phase of our work. So, um, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, might be the right time, but, you know, Clory, you've done, uh, first of all, I, again, I'm, I'm just in awe of the work that you and, and the committee did in organizing um, and holding this hearing. And, and let me ask you this before I go to this, I want to show some of, this, of the testimony, but, you know, from your point of view, you know, these hearings are going to be happening all over the state and communities all over the state now, we know that. Based on your experience, what, what should people know about about preparing for the hearings and about um, expanding the, the reach of the people who are invested in what goes on. First, I just wanna say thank you so much to Will and everyone else on this panel for allowing me to participate in this super important work and Allegheny County being the first, there was so much you know that we didn't know, right? And we were figuring out as we went along and we had great partnership um, from the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project and others and the commission as well. And when we think about what to consider, the first is that you can be caught up in the act of producing the actual hearing itself. And it's important to not allow that to overshadow how you do the work together in a way that, um, as Dr. Curry put it, um, does not continue the trauma-informed behaviors that we know. So we all exist in white supremacist structures because that's what we have and that's what we know. And so when you try to do something different, it's very uncomfortable. And it sometimes can feel like it might be stalling the work, but that is the work. The work is doing something different. So for us, that meant bringing in the descendants in the process and creating a lot of transparency. So we not only worked with them to collect oral history through the support of Jack, but we also made sure that they understood the structure. We made sure that they understood how that structure evolved. And we not only invited them, but really encouraged them to give us the feedback and tell us when we needed to do something different. And when they spoke up, we heard them and we made adjustments. And I think that that was the most important thing, changing that power dynamic 
of saying, these are the descendants, what's important to them is what should be driving our process, not what we think or maybe what we have constructed prior to uh, finding and working with them. And it was so, it was such a powerful experience for anyone who was there or anyone who's watching. And, and I did wanna maybe just show a, an excerpt of, um, of, the, uh, of, of the testimony there. Two people I've tried to capture here that one is the uh, niece uh, or the grand the grand niece of um, Nicholas P Nicol is it Nicholas Page I can't remember his, the first name now Jesse 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 Page and uh, and Jesse Page was a, a companion of uh, Robert Hughes who was the victim and who was um, himself arrested at the same time um, but was released right or was he or yes. is that wrong you're absolutely right except that it's uh, his granddaughter okay it's his granddaughter yeah. and then also there's um, um, two great nieces of the victim uh, himself, Robert Hughes. And so you'll hear from uh, one of them as well. So just want, it's, it's a little, it's like six minutes, but I think it's worth listening to. Um, so I was in grade school when my great grandpap died. Um, I remember going to the family home and he was present, but he was somewhat distant. He didn't act, interact with us much. Of course, at the age of 24, Jesse Page's life changed forever because as you heard, he was with Robert Hughes, AKA William Burns, on um, the night that Officer Baker died. If not for um, Mr. Burns stating that Jesse Page was uninvolved in the incident, um, I'm not sure I would be here today. He surely saved my grandpa's life. Today, I'm imagining the terror that these young men must have felt. I'm imagining the pain that all families, all three families, senselessly endured. Jesse Page spent most of his life in fear. Clearly, this was a traumatic event which, which shaped his life. My interactions with him were brief and distant. Where I knew most of my great grandparents, I knew very little about Jesse Page. He spent much of his life being distant and inwardly hiding, clearly not wishing to have any conflicts and who could blame him because Jesse Page surely knew how they could end. It saddens me that I didn't know more about the man, Jesse Page. But what I do know is that his descendants went on to become nurses, doctors, social workers, teachers, business owners, architects, state employees, and retired servicemen and women. How ironic that every week I, a descendant of Jesse Page, walk the very ground where Robert Hughes took his last breath. It will never just be the entrance to the courthouse. It will forever be a reminder of the importance of equal justice. I wanna thank the commission for allowing us to tell our stories and assisting us in advancing efforts to not just the idea of equal justice under the law, but the action of equal justice under the law. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, Ms. Renee Page. We will now hear from the sisters, Karen White and Angela Davidson. Good morning. Today is October the 2nd, 2021. My name is Angela Hughes Davidson. I am the great granddaughter of Wormley H. and Georgetta Berber Hughes. Their son, Robert W. Hughes, is my great uncle and brother of my grandfather, John Henry Hughes. I think I was in my early teens when I learned of my grandfather's brother, Robert, who was said to have gone away. I don't recall my father Lloyd speaking of him. At the time, I do remember thinking his disappearance held some sort of mystery. It was not until this past summer when Karen received a call from Chloe Jackson informing her of a lynching victim by the name of William Burns that the mystery of what happened to our Uncle Robert began to unfold. 
evidence concluded that William Burns was indeed our great uncle, Robert W. Hughes. We are here today because Robert was the victim of a lynching. It has been described as horrific and yet not a lot different from other such events described and recorded in America's history. Our uncle Robert's fate was like that of far too many African-American men. The shock of the circumstances of Robert's death brought another portion of America's ugly history to our family's doorstep and was brought with a devastating finding. The death of any 18 year old very young man pulled at one's heartstrings. Had Robert been allowed due process, if guilty, serving out his sentence, if innocent, continuing to mature as a free young man, he might have lived to marry and raise a family. He might have lived a long life like his sister Ethel, 99 years old, and brother John Henry, my grandfather, 95 years old. Had due process been afforded Robert, guilty or innocent, today's hearing would not be necessary. Today's proceedings demonstrate the desire of many in our society to acknowledge our country's history, both the great and the terrible. We must listen to families who have experienced the results of lynching and realize it tears a community's residents black and white apart. Robert Hughes was denied due process. Robert Hughes was lynched by a mob. Robert Hughes was denied the dignity of our traditional African-American burial customs. Robert Hughes's family was denied the opportunity to quietly mourn his loss, but was faced with published media accounts. Robert Hughes's mother and siblings did not receive an apology or compensation in compassion for the crime committed against brother and son. Robert Hughes's descendants until 2021 were denied the truth of the events surrounding his death. We ask that today's hearing serve an example to others in this important work of truth and reconciliation. Only with this knowledge and acceptance of truth can our family, our community, our nation move forward in hope, knowing that all lives matter. Thank you. This is powerful stuff. Um, and that really, uh, well, I just think it shows how, how compelling and how important these, these hearings can be and why the testimony is gonna be so important. And, um, you know, Jack, I know you are uh, coordinating the work of the Oral History Initiative. And, <clears throat> and it's actually kind of set up, I think, as, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a scouting mission because it's, it kind of mirrors the, the, uh, the sequence of, of the hearings. And I, I wanted to wonder if you could explain to people, you know, who you're interviewing and how that whole process works and how community members can, can help that effort. Sure. And, and first of all, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be on this panel with uh, Delegate Melanick, Cora Jackson, and Dr. Curry. I look up to all of you immensely. Um, and thank you, Will, for the opportunity and uh, to everybody in, in attendance today. Um, as Will mentioned, the Maryland Lynching Oral History Initiative, what we're doing is we're conducting virtual and in-person oral history interviews with the descendants, particularly of racial terror lynching victims, as well as the descendants of perpetrators. Um, we're also interviewing historians, activists, politicians, and others that are connected to the dozens of documented racial terror lynchings that took place in the state of Maryland between 1854 and 1933. What the initiative has done thus far and will continue to do is provide local county coalitions of the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project and their local partners with oral history resources, um, primarily a technology called Their Story. It works a lot like Zoom, which we're doing this, this uh, conference through. It allows us to capture both virtual, like I said, and in-person interviews, and also quickly and accurately transcribe those interviews. We're also providing the local co coalitions with uh, workflow guidance, documentation, and archival resources to make sure that these interviews are preserved and protected. And like Will mentioned, we're thinking about these oral histories as, as a dress rehearsal, if you will, for the commission's public hearings. What the oral histories allow us to do is it provides an opportunity for those who will be giving testimony at the public hearings, mainly descendants, to correct and define the narrative. 
Um, we also are, are framing this process, this oral history process as reparative and corrective, um, particularly for the descendants of the lynching victims. As, as Clory noted, we are really focused on transparency, affording the, the descendants uh, respect, dignity, and, and safety, as well as ownership and authority across the entire interview process. Something else that we're working on is providing all interviewees with culturally responsive trauma-informed counseling services um, in, in case we need to address issues uh, regarding re-traumatization. Um, so those are all things that we're thinking about uh, with, with regards to the World History Initiative. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Jack, you know, what, one of the points that uh, we raised from time to time in, in this effort is that there, you know, there's no instruction manual for, for doing this. No one, no one handed us a guide or a step-by-step -step sequence of, of how to go about doing these things. And one of, one of my own concerns um, is that for these hearings to be effective, it seems to me there needs to be you know, public buy-in. Um, there needs to be people, we need people invested. And I'm wondering uh, if, uh, I'd like to ask all of you actually, what what we can do, what, what needs to be done in order to get the public more engaged in this process. Gloria, you look like you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Always ready. Mm. I think going back to having the courage to do something different and getting public engagement, it can be really easy to overlook potential partnerships because they may not be easy or there might not be really strong, positive history there. And we had that in Allegheny County, and I'm sure that every single county and every single community has that, right? So for us, that meant reaching over to our chief of police to say, hey, we really want you here. And you'll often be surprised about the response that you might get. In our case, the chief of police was like, I, you know, thank you for asking. I wasn't sure if it was appropriate for me to be there. I wanted to give you all the space. And I said, I appreciate that. However, you being a part of this conversation is critical to that healing process. I think also keeping in mind that the healing process also has a little bit of friction and friction is not bad. Friction is growth. When we have a wound, healing sometimes itches or it scabs or it hurts, but then it gets better, right? And then you're healed. So remembering that the healing process is not always easy. It's not always simple. And part of that is doing something different, doing the unexpected, or trying something hard in order to gain a more powerful result. Thanks. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Delegate Penny Melnick, how do we, how do we make this um, important to, to, to people, to, to people who might not be involved yet? I think it's about getting the information out, um, as Ms. Jackson just stated, you know, getting the information out into the community educating our community about our history and the importance, going into the schools, educating our next generation, right? Our future um, in our elementary school, middle school, high school, um, using social media, thinking outside the box. Um, we must be creative with our message and be consistent and not be shy about it. How about uh, Nick or Jack, do you have uh, any thoughts about how we can make this more um, important, right, to other people. Yeah, I'll, you know, just follow up on, on what, you know, Clory and, and Delegate Pena Melnick have said. Certainly, yeah, we need to engage and, you know, certainly uh, you know, engage in the, the educational, you know, aspects of this and get the word and the information out. I mean, you know me, Will, you know, I'm always up for the incendiary, more sort of, <laughs> you know, radical thing. I mean, I, I would love for us to use the the subpoena power that the commission has. You know, I would love to you know engage in some symbolic posthumous you know indictments of of members of the lynching mobs that that we've been able to identify. You know, and that you know Dr. Chavis's work you know has has done some great work on that front. You know, in terms of identifying members of the mobs, right? You know, I, I think getting that kind of information out and doing it in that guise would certainly catch the public imagination and catch the public eye. Um, whether or not that would bring people, you know, to the table, to the discussions, you know, I, I don't know, but I think it certainly would start some conversations that absolutely need to happen. 
you know, and again, I, I, I don't know that that's the best way to do it, but it certainly would get people talking. And if nothing else, to have the conversations, those really uncomfortable conversations, I would imagine, particularly for the, you know, for the descendants and the family members of those people identified as having been parts of the mob. I mean, give them an opportunity to come and speak and to, to talk about, you know, what, what does that mean for them? What are the implications for the people on, on, on that side of, of these stories? And, and what, what are their stories? Because we need to hear them as well and make space for them to be part of the conversation, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we move forward? How do we reconcile? How do we repair when, you know, your predecessors, you know, were the ones who were, who were causing so much of this pain? You know, and I, I, those hearings for on the on uh, Somerset and Wicomico County, they're they're going to be kind of late in the in the rota in the in the in the uh, in the schedule. So, I'm you know I think it's going to be a challenge for you and the other commissioners um, to determine how you are going to do that because we do know who was involved, right? And we there were arrests made right, in the George Armwood case, and those guys were released in two minutes because the um, state's attorney refused to. Uh, allow the evidence that had been uh, all the interviews, the 40 something interviews that, that the attorney general had collected. So um, that's, that's gonna be a challenge, but I agree with you that would, that would certainly ignite some um, fire. Jack, any thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah, I, I wanted to add on to the education piece specifically, which has been mentioned by all the, the panelists thus far, um, specifically the nature of the information that we are and will be distributing with, you know, through the public hearings, through curriculum, so on and so forth. I think it's very important that we understand this fact, which is that what we know about lynching in Maryland is defined by sources that almost universally defend the lynching regime. What we're working with is, is a chorus of largely white newspaper sources that regurgitates constantly the lie that black people are inherently criminal and lustful. Um, and these sources, they have been digitized, made widely available, while other perspectives, particularly the pers perspectives of black Marylanders have been marginalized. So with, with relation to the oral history initiative, what we are looking to do is resist and revise the established lynching record um, and ensure that the voices, perspectives, and lived experiences of those who resisted and persisted in the aftermath of racial terror lynching, that their perspectives are heard. Um, something else I, I wanted to say just that's very relevant to those in attendance today, um, as I'm sure you could imagine, one of the most challenging parts of not just the oral history process, but also the, the public hearing process is identifying those who are willing to provide testimony and those who, who can provide relevant testimony, right? Finding interviewees, finding people who can provide testimony. I think something that we don't acknowledge enough is that many of those who, who could provide testimony, particularly descendants of lynching victims, they still rightfully so fear localized retaliation for speaking out uh, with good reason. So what we've, we've tried to do here between the public hearing and the oral history process are create safe and supportive spaces for their stories to be told. Um, you know, there is little doubt in my mind that for every single person who's in attendance today, uh, a lynching occurred in or near your community. Because for each victim, there are networks of dozens of people who lived through the lynching and the aftermath of the lynching. So I would encourage everyone in attendance to listen again to that victim remembrance ceremony that we heard a few minutes ago. And if you have knowledge of a lynching, whether that's intergenerational memories of a lynching, or if you have reason to believe you're a descendant of a, of a lynching victim or a perpetrator, uh, it's so important that you speak out and share your truth if you're comfortable. Um, and you can reach out to all of us to, to do so. Jack, thank you so much for that. That is, that is so important. And it, it is deliberate, right? Reconciliation, truth, and re that it's deliberate. We have to want to do it. We have to intend it. And um, I, you, that was really eloquently put. And I really appreciate it. Nick, do you have yeah, can I just you know, chime in uh, just to pick up on that? Um, again, we talk about you know, the, the documented racial terror lynchings. I mean, these are the ones that we know about because 
there's a paper trail. You know, um, in, in the work that I was doing with my students when we first started this at, at Bowie State, you know, we came across, you know, bits and pieces of things, you know, where people, you know, you could see that there were oral, you know, remembrances, you know, and some people, you know, put them up in, in blogs and stuff like that on the web, but there was no documentation and on a couple of them, we really tried, you know, we, you know, spent, you know, hours and you know, days in the, the state archives in Annapolis, trying to follow some of these, these leads on these oral remembrances and, and we couldn't find them, you know, so yes, we know about these 38, but how many more are out there that are still remembered, but we don't have the documentation for. And that, you know, it's, it's the proverbial tip of the iceberg in, in some ways. But I think, yes, if you, if you know of anything like that, if you have those stories, those remembrances, um, a colleague of mine at Bowie State said more than likely most Black families in this country, you know, have some story, you know, related to lynching in their histories. And so if that is the case, if, if you know of anything or know of anyone or have any of these stories in your families, please do share them with us. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much. So we, I, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us this morning, for spending your time and, uh, uh, and sharing your, your thoughts with us. It has been incredibly helpful. And I, I did want to mention also to people right before we, we go to the next thing is that if, if you haven't seen the um, Allegheny County um, um, hearing, you, you can. It's available on our um, website, on the, our YouTube channel. And I would really urge you to, especially people who are going to be involved in upcoming hearings, because there's a lot to learn. Um, they did a wonderful job. And, and also, I, I want to recognize um, the incredible job that the commission did uh, in getting ready for that hearing. Particularly, I wanted to um, um, single out the, the chair, David Falconley, um, the vice chair, Charles Davis, who we're about to hear from, and David Armenti and Maya Davis. They really did the heavy lifting for the commission on this, uh, on the Allegheny hearing. And um, we should all be grateful to them for the effort they put in. So um, thank you all again, and we're going to um, uh, move on to our next topic. And I, 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 um, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you again. So I want to now um, welcome uh, Dr. Charles Chavis. He is um, the founding director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, uh, Justice, and Race. Uh, he is uh, at George Mason University. He's a member of uh, the board of directors for uh, the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. He's the vice chair of the uh, Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, he uh, has just written a wonderful new book uh, about the lynching of Matthew Williams, but he also talks about how that murder still resonates in the uh, city's black communities. And I, I'm assuming that Charles has control of the screen. And so Charles, take it away. Wow, thank you, um, Will. I wanna thank the panelists. I saw a number of friends and others who I extremely look up to um, and who have served as um, inspiration for me on this journey and I'm thankful um, to um, Delegate Pena Milnick, um, Nicholas Creary, Corey Jackson, and a good friend of mine, um, Jack Del Nunzio. And um, Will, you know, we're, we're, we're buddies, so we're best buds. Almost talk to you every day. So <laughs> thankful for this opportunity um, to share with you all the journey, briefly, the journey um, that brought me to publishing this book, which predated the work of the commission and predated um, my work with the Maryland Lynch Memorial Project. And it's something that uh, has been really dear to me. Um, and as a historian, you know, what, what really is disturbing, not only as a historian, but also for as someone of African um, descent and African American in this country, what we see um, even today, contemporarily, we see um, so much debate about systemic racism, about critical race theory, all of these terms. Um, and, and what's frustrating is that in black communities, we there's a the history and the legacy of racial terror and racial violence is something that we've always known, right? We've known that there's a direct line between the um, systemic, um, the lynchings of old with the systemic and ongoing anti-black violence that um, we continue to witness every day um, with the um, beginning of this uh, movement with Black Lives Matter, you know, these things have always been happening in the black community. We've known the truth about them, right? However, um, the larger public, America um, and history has recorded 
um, to Jack Del Nunzio's point earlier, what those in power have wished to record and to privilege in the narrative. Um, and so um, I sought out after discovering about the lynching of Matthew Williams um, as a doctoral student, I sought out to salvage the humanity of this victim with Matthew Williams and his community. And in doing that, I, I hit the wall that most historians and most lynching scholars um, often hit. And I ran up against this wall where the only sources that I could find were the white newspapers, but I'm thankful for the Baltimore Afro-American and the black press, because it was the black press in Maryland that held the state accountable um, and held the community accountable. Um, and these journalists um, are not only just journalists. And when I say journalists, young Clarence Mitchell, we have um, also photojournalist um, Paul Henderson. Both of them were on the scene in this community um, following days after, the day after the lynching. And because of their heroism, um, I was able to begin to tra trace the steps um, and to begin to do a thorough investigation and hold the state as well as the local community accountable. Um, and so it was at that point when I um, began reading um, some of the articles that came out from the Afro when I was a doctoral student at Morgan, I noticed that they referenced a number of reports um, that the governor had been um, pulling together through his racial um, interracial commission. And I went to the state archives, you know, doing um, following up on my leads as I as most historians do. And I noticed when I called for those um, records to come down, the records specifically pertaining to the investigation of the lynching of Matthew Williams and George Armwood, um, I was astonished to receive boxes that um, on, were empty. Right, the, the specific years corresponding with the lynching of Matthew Williams and George Armwood, these boxes in the state archives were empty. There was nothing in these boxes. And so that is when I began to, um, I felt like I was a hound dog and I was like, listen, I'm on the scent. I figured this out, right? There's something going on here. And I, I didn't assume that this was something done, um, you know, on purpose, but rather um, it, consistent with what we know about the nature of archives and archival institutions. We think about systemic racism. You know, systemic racism shows and is um, laid bare in all areas and in all institutions. And indeed, the archives is an institution that has failed not only um, at local and state levels, but to privilege and salvage the voices of those who are the most oppressed among us. And African Americans have represent those communities. And so it was no shock to me that such records were missing. Um, and as I began to do more and more research, and I, I wouldn't take no for an answer, I kept looking, I discovered files at the state archives pertaining to um, the investigation um, into both lynchings. I discovered that um, there was a public investigation that was made known and published in the press that um, Governor Albert Ritchie um, had boldly talked about, um, as, as well as the local um, state's attorney and the current attorney general at the time, Preston Lane. Um, so this investigation was made known to the public as it was published in the newspaper. However, once I finally located these records in, um, within the state archives that were stored off site, they were um, in horrible condition. Um, and I literally had to um, I called the records. They came off site um, from an off site storage facility. And it was boxes upon boxes of witness statements from eyewitnesses. I'm just going to let it sit for a second. Witness statements of both black and I, black and white eyewitnesses, contemporaneous statements from those who witnessed the lynching. And I thought about at that moment Professor Sherilyn Eiffel's work about this um, system of silence that she discusses. And traditionally, when we think of lynching, indeed, it is a system of silence that emerges. And this is why on most um, documents pertaining to the investigations around lynching and most um, white newspapers, the publications, um, they oftentimes state that you know, lynchings took place at the hands of persons unknown. Because Black communities, yes, were indeed fearful of speaking out. But white communities, as what happened in Salisbury and on the Eastern Shore, and argue, I would argue throughout the state, were silent, especially poor whites because they were also um, 
uh, part of this larger system of silence. And their privileges, the little privileges that they had during the Great Depression, were tied to their ability to maintain the silence and to keep the status quo going, right? I mean, so this is the traditional um, thought process around the ways in which lynching, um, the culture of lynching um, emerges not only emerges and develops in the South, but also throughout the US. Um, and what I began to realize as I looked through these records was that um, that was not necessarily the case. We had, um, at least with the statements that I discovered, we had black witnesses who, um, whose stories were silenced, who spoke out, who risked their lives to speak truth to power. And this book profiles those voices. Um, one Dr. A.D. Brown is uh, the Eastern Shore physician. Traditionally, it was thought that he knew nothing of the lynching. In fact, um, as of yesterday, I discovered um, from interviewing um, Ms. Shaney Shields, who was, uh, an act, who was currently um, an active civil rights leader, he actually birthed Ms. Shaney Shields and he named her Dr. A.D. Brown on the Sal in Salisbury, Maryland. I, spent, I was there yesterday at the Charles Chipman Cultural Center, the only um, institution that is still standing in terms of cultural institution um, from the town in which Matthew Williams um, was born. And these records, like I said, reveal that it, you know what we know is a lie, right? We know that um, it's told, we were been told that black people were scared, they were fearful, they never spoke out, but the, um, that's not the case. They did speak out, but their voices were silenced by the state, by the institutions, by the local community. These records detail the heroism of people like Dr. A.D. Brown, who identified members of the mob by name. Um, and as I continued, I looked um, further and I discovered additional records that were um, very, very, were very cryptic, right? And I, I then saw that um, what was going on in terms of the investigation. And I noticed that Governor Ritchie, who was running for um, office at the time, he did not trust the Eastern Shore um, political leadership. He, did, he knew what was going on in the Eastern Shore in terms of racial violence. He was again jockeying himself as a presidential hopeful, hoping to contend with FDR at the time, right around 1931, the rise of the height of the Great Depression. He was hoping that um, his, his ability to speak out and to um, call out this investigation and to quell the lynch mob spirit and racial violence during the Depression, he was hoping his ability to do that would allow the nation to see him as a figure who could put um, lynching in check through executive power. However, what he began to notice when he came up against the Eastern Shore that they were not going to let go of this power easily. And as a result, um, he had no trust in the state's attorney at the time, um, Levin C. Bailey. Um, and so he actually commissioned a secret investigation to go parallel with the on the surface investigation that he um, had current at the time um, assigned um, Kristen, um, Preston Lane, who would become mayor. Preston Lane was assigned to be the individual to work with state's attorney of Wacomico County, Levin C. Bailey at the time. Um, and they, he um, basically, like I said, he did, a, he did not trust him. He had a parallel investigation. And it was at this time, Governor Ritchie, I discovered receipts, transcripts, invoices, bills, et cetera, from the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And this is where everything um, that we know um, came, everything that um, we thought we did not know came to light. And it was in this moment that I discovered that um, Governor Ritchie hired a Pinkerton detective agent to infiltrate the mob. Um, and following the conclusion of the um, fake, if you will, investigation that he allowed the state's attorney to believe that he was helping with, um, he dispatched an agent in the town. And I discovered um, this agent's journal. And within that journal, it details a three month investigation, um, his undercover activities day by day. Um, and he befriends members of the mob. He befriends local leaders, um, who some of who confess to this lynching. And 
individuals, everything that black community know, has known, everything that we've known historically, when we think about lynchings, all of it is true, that though lynchings, as we know, took place in um, plain sight. Those who were just like with January the 6th, as we watched um, with, as if we watched, as we watched and we saw how easy it was for this mob to take over an institution and to um, function and operate so easily. It almost was as if those who were sworn to protect and serve knew something was going on. And that is traditionally the case with lynching. And so with the investigation and with the, the, the Pinkerton's agents journal, we discovered that it was officers who were directly involved in this lynching. We discovered that the fire chief provided the rope to lynch Matthew Williams. We discovered that um, an individual who would eventually become the chief of police, chief of um, the fire department is the one who confesses to the agent that he poured the five gallons of gasoline on Matthew Williams. And since this discovery, I've um, my main focus has to get this information to the descendants. And um, in May, in May, excuse me, in March, or excuse me, May, PBS aired a segment on this research and on this work, but also on the ceremony and the marker unveiling in Salisbury. And it was at that time, um, I was so um, thankful to be able to um, connect the community with the descendants of Matthew Williams. And one of the reasons why my work and research has been so quiet is because um, I've been so um, sensitive with this work is because I've wanted to give the research and this work as a gift to the descendants. And to this point, we've not been able to, up until last two years ago, I was not, a, I was unable to identify the descendants, um, even collateral descendants of Matthew Williams. And um, it was at that time, two years ago, that I finally was able to connect them, connect them um, with this story and share this story with them. Um, and the re one of the reasons why, you know, they weren't around is because what we know about the nature of lynching, this act of racial terror and violence, we know that Black communities left, they fled, they were refugees escaping terror, right, they were fleeing. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over with, um, to Will, I kind of, my publicist is probably going to be upset, I shared a lot but it's fine, um, it's amongst family, but thank you all um, for this opportunity. Charles, before you go, I, I did wanna ask you if you could just briefly describe how the ways in which this, um, the Matthew Williams murder um, continues to resonate in, in, in Salisbury. Exactly, thank you, Will. So we, we think about Tulsa and we think about these communities, but what as I began to do my investigation, I also looked at um, the community, the humanity of Matthew Williams. And I noticed within the research that um, there was a direct correlation between the lynching of Matthew Williams and the systemic destruction of a Black community in Salisbury by Georgetown, which was a Black business district. It was nowhere near the size of Tulsa or Greenwood, but it was indeed a Black business district. It had its own, it was, they had their own bank. They had their own um you know, barbershop, there was a, it was a community, um, schools, residents, black owned businesses. And it was at this time, right at the year to at, right at the time of the lynching that um, a more um, less a less evasive approach to destroying a black community developed. Um, and the lynching was a message, I believe to the black community. Um, one of the things that people may not realize is um, at the conclusion of the lynching, the mob made sure to display Williams um, body on the black side of town at the um, area where Georgetown is currently, uh, where Georgetown was historically this black district, which is where Matthew Williams was from, which is a part of his community. And, um, uh, and my investigation is able to, uh, like I said, I uncover the systemic efforts through land displacements, through the similar strategies that we know about highway expansion um, for this community to, um, to be dismantled. And that's exactly what happened. The community was dismantled. And to this date, the only remaining building of the Georgetown community where Matthew Williams was from is the Charles Chipman Cultural Center. Um, and that is actually the church in which he attended. That's the only building that remains of Georgetown. 
even the um, the cemetery was split and bodies were exhumed from the black cemetery. Um, this is a um, just injustice that needs to be righted. And if I have anything to do with it in this work, um, I hope and pray will serve as a foundation for getting the black community of Salisbury the justice that they indeed deserve. Gross, thank, thank you so much for that. And I have no doubt that uh, you will prevail. And uh, I, I appreciate your efforts, of course, and, and um, look forward to helping with that. Thank you so much for your time today, Charles. I really appreciate it. Yeah.